uh, Dr. Meryl Hof Mayer. Hof Mayer, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And uh, she is a lecturer at uh, Farming System Ecology Group at Wageningen University. And her focus uh, on uh, crop biodiversity, wheat, etc. And he, uh, she uh, took a PhD at which university? Uh, <laughs> Rostock University was in Germany. <laughs> Oh, Rostock yeah. is in Germany. It's very small. <laughs> and, yeah. and start uh, as a lecturer here like maybe five years ago, yeah? Yeah. Approximately. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and our topic today uh, will be or will be about uh, crop management, uh, focus in uh, organic agriculture, uh, but also on uh, crop biodiversity. Yeah, how uh, how main crop uh, can be uh, how do you call it uh, have with uh, with uh, have more friends. Yes. Like that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you can start. Uh, All right. I'll start sharing my screen in the meantime. Uh, okay. Let's see, we'll see my beautiful backgrounds for a second. Well, uh, I fire up. Uh, ooh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> nice. Uh, somewhere okay. in the Alps, I think. <laughs> hey, uh, it, yeah, it's impossible in the Netherlands. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, this is not Dutch. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you, Uma, for, uh, uh, for the introduction. Uh, indeed, I am uh, mostly working working on crop and crop management. I do that uh, in organic cropping systems. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit today about management uh, and how to manage crops. And I'll tell you a little bit of what happens if we start mixing crops. So how to, uh, what to expect and how to do it. Um, I'm very aware <laughs> that I'm speaking from um, a European context, a very temperate context. Uh, with uh, one summer, so one growing season and a winter, <laughs> where uh, way less is happening. Um, so if you have any questions, if you have any uh, uh, examples from your background, and I'm very happy to discuss that. Um, but most of the examples I'll show you are from here. So that's uh, just uh, for your information. But let's see. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so as uh, I'm working at Farming System Ecology, we uh, yeah, see the, the farming system as a whole. So we're aware that there are many uh, different areas within it, um, being the soil site, uh, then there is uh, the nutrients going to the plants, and the plants uh, or the crops go back, um, go via maybe livestock or, uh, or a compost heap uh, when discussing these systems. Um, this is a little bit, <laughs> this is course context, don't worry about this. Um, but I want to go here. Uh, so uh, I normally cover a whole week about plants and crops. So what I hope you take away is that crops and plants are very fascinating organisms. Um, I'll talk a little bit today about management. So how to grow a healthy crop, uh, organic crop management, protection, uh, and a little bit about production. Then uh, the second part will be on the yeah the plant one friends too so the the uh, understanding how crop diversity functions uh, the benefits of it and identifying some different systems where they apply crop uh, or plant diversity um, so that's what I will talk about today um, we'll uh, not cover trees today so that's just still in the slides but that's not for you guys uh, I don't think yeah. I have to yeah. Uh, just a bit uh, announcement to other students. If they want to have a question, just feel free to put uh, in the chat or even you can raise hand and directly uh, address yes. it to uh, Meryl. Yeah? So don't be shy. No, don't be shy. You can ask me anything. Or you can ask me a lot. I don't know if I know all the answers. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at least we can try here. And otherwise, I think you know anyway. Um. Well, this is very basic plant physiology. So 
where plants are green green organisms they have photosynthesizing parts they have uh, often root systems where they take up nutrients for their growth and water um because they are and i'll go through this a little bit quicker because i think you guys will know uh because they're photosynthesizing so they're all trophic they create their own food um by uh using solar energy uh, and converting that into sugars and by that, they are converting ox uh, CO2 into oxygen um, and they're using water for this process. So the most important thing to understand is that every plant has different requirements for this um, and grow a healthy crop. You have to be mindful of this, that they get the right amount of water, get the right amount of sun um, and the right amount of nutrients to do so. Um, and with that, they are... That's why I think they're so exciting. They're at the bottom of the trophic level. So uh, they are really the primary producers putting energy into our system. So they are feeding us, they're feeding uh, the ecosystem. And I think that's really the motor of the whole ecosystem for us. Um, there you go. So as I said, they need nutrients to do so. <clears throat> so nutrient management is incredibly important. Uh, they need, uh, well, we always focus on the three big ones, so the NPK amounts, nitrogen, phosphorus, and uh, potassium. Uh, and these have big roles within the plant. So uh, nitrogen uh, creates 50% of dry moth. It's there for enzymes, for chlorophyll, uh, of which they, of course, photosynthesize. Um, phosphorus is really for processes, uh, including DNA, that they need enough phosphorus to, uh, to grow and to perform their functions. Uh, and potassium is more regulatory uh, and it helps with liquid movements within. So there are the macronutrients, there's calcium, magnesium, and sulfur, for example, and micronutrients, iron deficiency in health. Uh, we look very much at soil fertility, uh, that these are uh, provided by fertility management. Um, and then again, every plant's a bit different in their requirements. So based on the plant and the crop and knowing that crop, uh, you can apply uh, accordingly. And you can often see if we uh, look on the pictures, uh, you can spot deficiencies uh, in plants. Phosphate is a very uh, clear one because then the, the leaves often turn red uh, in maize plants here, for example. All right. Um, well, in conventional agriculture, of course, you can adjust the fertilizer you choose with, uh, uh, with amendments you like it to have. Uh, but also in organic agriculture, there are some ways of tweaking how you get uh, the right balance. Um, so there are different uh, organic manures. So uh, going from compost or manure. And manure from different uh, animals also have different contents. Uh, but you can also think of blood meal or of bone meal. Um, or adding legumes, uh, which all have, you can <laughs> tweak the balance in your soil and provide your crop with the right amount of nutrients. It's a little bit less precise, but there are possibilities there. All right. Um, of course, plants take these nutrients up. They do that by their rhizosphere, uh, where they have, uh, well, you can see on the left picture, uh, a huge amount of uh, surface area. Uh, and the surface area is um, covered in sort of uh, <laughs> slime. It's a very moisture environment. Uh, and here uh, they have, uh, uh, there's a lot of microorganisms growing. There is um, a direct interaction with the water uh, in the soil where soluble nutrients are taken up or by uh, help by the uh, microorganisms. They have this relationship that the microorganisms will find uh, the nutrients and exchange those with the plant. Um, so again, very important to have a healthy and balanced soil um, and everything is ready to move there. Another way we get, so you can import nutrients, um, there's also nitrogen fixation and that's uh, done by leguminous plants um, that have a relationship with certain bacteria, so rhizobia, that lives in root nodules. So the plant creates these nodules, the bacteria can move in, and um, there they have uh, interaction. So they are provided with housing, and that's they, they pay rent, let's say, by providing the plant with nutrients from the, with nitrogen from the air. 
Um, here, uh, for us, we have a lot of annuals who do that, uh, not many plants, uh, many trees, not many perennials. So we have clover, beans, peas, uh, lupines, um, uh, plants that are capable of this interaction. Um, however, if we go a bit more tropical, we also see a lot of trees uh, that are able to do this. Um, mimosas and acacias are generally a capable of this relationship. Um, so here, uh, here in, in, in the Netherlands, we grow a lot of uh, clover uh, or other legumes uh, to help us with adding nitrogen back to the soil. Um, and that's often grass clover lays. Uh, and we have a lot of cows, if you might know. <laughs> we have a, a lot of milk production. So this links up to our farming system that we can feed the grass clover to the cows. Um, yeah, and that's how that's another route of adding that nitrogen uh, back into the soil from the air by plants. So also an important one to keep in mind. All right. Um, then of course we grow uh, plants. We grow crops, right? So we have uh, specific plant species that we grow for a wide range of products. Um, <clears throat> And it, it, it's all sizes why I pulled up cabbage. <laughs> so uh, the cabbage family, uh, I think all parts of the cabbage are grown into a kind of crop. So um, mustards, uh, they will use the seeds for their, uh, for their compounds, for their spicy compounds. Um, there is microgreens, there's roots, radishes, daikons. Um, there are uh, the big cabbage heads that we grow. So that's, again, that's the leaves of the plant or the bud. Um, there is, uh, we grow kohlrabi here. So that's the stem part of the cabbage. Uh, and then broccoli and cauliflower. So making use of the, the flower of the cabbage. So you see that uh, within crops, we uh, use almost all organs of the plants for, for our use. And our use is very wide. So, of course, we think of crops that we eat, so our own food. But, of course, we grow a lot of crops as fodder. So, for the food of our food, <laughs> the food of, our, that, of the animals that we use. Um, we use it as fuel, fiber. There's oils produced, uh, as I showed the last example, fertilization. Um, but also aesthetics. So, uh, flowers, there's a lot of flowers being grown because we like it and we love flowers and it's a, it's a crop for us. Um, tulip, tulip fields here. <laughs> uh, and tulips are widely known and that's, uh, it's another kind of crop just for beauty. Um, and then of course, medicine. So we, uh, there are still a lot of crops grown specifically to make medication out of. We'll get back to that in the next slide. Um, and then there's a whole area or whole study field uh, of ethnobotany. So understanding how we and, and plants are interacting, how we make use of those. All right. So we see this, um, yeah, how, <laughs> how we use plants. And uh, uh, we see now that uh, at least here, um, our diversity uh, is going down. We're currently, um, there are about 250 different types of plants that we use uh, for our utilization for, for humans. And currently we focus about on about 30 species, and this is from food. Um, and if you can see on the, on the uh, left down slide, you can see that there are four crops that we grow most in the world. So that's wheat, maize, rice, and soybean. So these are the most grown, widely grown crops. So that's only four of the 250 species that are available. Um, and yeah, so there's starch crops uh, for many different uses. Um, you can also see uh, sugar cane. So for, uh, that's a, a low acreage, but a high, uh, high income crop and a very high uh, producing crop, produces sugars, um, all the way to, I think, for example, opium poppies. I talked about uh, medication. And here in um, Czech Republic, for example, they grow a lot of uh, poppies, which are uh, used uh, by pharmacies or uh, pharmaceutics to make morphine out of. 
So it's still a very important crop to grow, uh, to create medication uh, to help people with. Um, but we can also see that we're starting to uh, reduce the amount of genetic diversity we have. Um, so where it used to be around 1900s, I, I'm not sure where this is, but uh, we had about 460 different types of radishes. Uh, we now have about 20 types of radishes. So we really see that we are um, starting to focus our efforts on specific strains. And we are losing a little bit of genetic diversity here and there. Something to be aware of. Okay, so that's about crops. Uh, yeah, I, I keep hammering on healthy crops. So how do we manage them? Um, there is uh, well, the saying of uh, soil is a lifetime investment. Uh, animals are a daily chore. And crops define, in our case, our year, or they define the farmer's season. Um, and it's... The process is roughly the same <laughs> in most areas in the world. We are starting with a soil preparation. We want a healthy soil. We want it manageable. Uh, we want it to have a nice structure. Um, and it's the right place for crops to grow. So we're starting with that preparation. And that can be plowing. It can be tillage. Um, so we see uh, that in different areas. Used to be, <laughs> we used to be in some areas is still with animal power, um, but also with machine power. So, so bad preparation um, and seed bed preparation. So, we're starting to sow something here. Um, we're sowing crops into that field, into that soil, uh, after which they'll be managed. So, uh, we are trying to reduce wheat pressure, we're trying to do reduce diseases or the pests that are eating these crops. So this is weeding, a weeding treatment, for example. Uh, weeding in rice paddies. And here we have uh, adding natural enemies to your field to prevent uh, pests of invading your crop. Uh, and then, of course, we hope that there's a harvest. So we can see uh, harvest moments incredibly important, also culturally. Uh, this is a picture from the Ukraine, where uh, this is 100 years ago, where they're harvesting the grains. And it's often a time of, uh, here in the Netherlands, it's our summer holidays, that's around harvest time, because kids were being pulled out of school anyway. So it <laughs> gave them off. Um, and, uh, but we see it's an important moment in a, in a community. You're reaping the benefits of your work and of your labor. And um, it's often harvest fests because you have yeah, secured your food security for another season. After that, you're preparing for next season again. So in this case, we have a, a cover crop sodium. All right, so I mentioned plowing a bit. So I want to mention that here too. Uh, soil preparation. So here we can see um, uh, plowing action. I think this is... No, it's I think the Netherlands. Uh, so here we uh, we plow our soils. Uh, we have quite big machines for this, uh, and that creates a nice structure of the soil. It releases the nutrients for the plants. Um, uh, it helps with water uh, water regulation. Um, but we can also see it has some disadvantages. Uh, its soil life generally is dis uh, disrupted by this action. And we can also see how this, uh, on this picture, <laughs> this quite big tractor is, um, yeah, we call it, it's driving quite heavily on its right track. And this is a point uh, where compaction will take place. Um, so we're quite worried that a lot of soils are getting compacted by this action, by driving on that layer. Um, so we're thinking of other ways of plowing to reduce this uh, disruption uh, and still create a nice seed bed. So on the left side, we see uh, eco mobile plow. So it's less deep. It's not 30 centimeters anymore. It's about 10 to 15. It's driving on the soil instead of uh, in a thorough. It also helps with compaction. And on the right side, we see non-inversion tillage. So it's more of a rotor till, just flops it up, but it's not this inversion motion. Um, so we're trying to be creative about how to treat that soil. Uh, the same is with conservation agriculture. 
where uh, yeah, we're trying to avoid disruption of the soil and by adding residues and by having a healthy crop rotation. So all things to think about when when managing or when growing something. All right. So then at the end, we hope, of course, that we're having uh, we're having a healthy soil, right? And then we did all the things right. We um, it was uh, it was a healthy soil preparation. All the nutrients were there. We tried to protect them from weeds and pests and disease, and we harvested some time. And then there's yield. So we have a production. Um, and uh, that's what we see here. Uh, it's something we can calculate during the season. We can sort of uh, think about. Um, and uh, has an, a turnout. So we, there's, uh, I showed some uh, European averages, or just in the USA as well. So wheat, generally we find four to eight tons per hectare, just to get an idea of numbers. Um, maize, uh, five to 15 tons per hectare. Um, potatoes, 40 to 50 tons. Sugar beets, 75 tons. Soy. Uh, soy, peanuts, and sunflowers, two to three tons. So I have a bit of a question for you. Let's see if that works. <laughs> um, it, why are these numbers different? Do you know? Why is potato so massively much higher than maize or wheat? Anyone who would dare think about that? Or you throw it in the chat and then we'll read it there. If you just like to think about it, hmm? Uma? why potato higher uh, the yield of potato higher yeah. than example maize? Yes, why? <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference between these crops? That don't say it's paid. <laughs> Hi, student. <laughs> what do you think? Oh, there is something in chat. Yeah, we'll check. Oh, no. oh, it said it's possible. Uh, oh, it's genetically modified. Ah, genetic uh, modification. Yes. Um, is that the case? No. No, genetically modification is um, still not allowed in organic. Yeah. Yeah. That's also the difficult piece. For students in Indonesia to study in the Netherlands, it was also happened to me because actually, <laughs> yeah, for example, this one, uh, the potato yield in Indonesia only 15 tons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. There are for sure differences <laughs> locally. Also, I've not included rice here, for example. It's like, um, but just to keep you thinking, it's not the circumstances that create this. It's really the crop. So uh, what's, uh, why do soy and peanuts and sunflowers generally yield a bit lower uh, than the other thing? Think of their organs. So think of what we harvest and think of the interest there. Yeah. So maybe that helps. So what do we harvest if we harvest potatoes? Or what do we harvest if we harvest sunflowers? Or what do we harvest if we harvest rice? What's our interest? Yeah. Any idea? <clears throat> oh. <laughs> okay. Well. It really depends. So it doesn't depend on the circumstances. We'll see that harvests or, or yields are, are very <laughs> dispersed depending on the location. Um, but yields are also dependent on the crop type. So when we harvest wheat, uh, we harvest these kernels, right? So um, that's uh, about, I think, in the end, depending on the variety, about 50% of the biomass. Uh, but if we harvest maize, we get... Uh, twice as much we expect. Um, if we harvest potatoes, we harvest tubers. And those are fresh tubers and they contain a lot more water. So what we're harvesting is roughly the same 
uh, starch content, <laughs> but there is 80, 80, 90 percent water in there. Um, while wheat, uh, there's some small little kernels and they contain, say, well, we 10 to 20 is above the, the highest point. We want water in there. We want very dry. So it's very pure starches. However, if we would harvest soy or um, um, soy, we are looking at the protein crop. And proteins, and if we look at peanuts and oils, we harvest the seeds that are very oil rich. And proteins and oils are very hard for plants to synthesize. So let me see if I can go to the next slide. There we go. Um, differences in outcomes are often linked to uh, yeah, what are you harvesting uh, and how easy is it for the plant? For plants, it's easy to make sugars, relatively, um, and harder to make proteins or harder to synthesize oils because they need to do that process for you. Just a, a mindset. All right. Um, yeah, of course. Well, of course. Not of course, but uh, yeah, I'm working with organic. So we're often talking about yield gaps. Uh, so I showed you just now are the conventional yields. And, um, but of course, uh, inorganic, we expect way lower yields. And this yield is often 20, 10 to 30% lower uh, than uh, the conventional yields we expect here. Um, is that a question in the chat? Do you see something oh. popping up? Okay, well, that's not for me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so to understand how that yield gap appears, I think it's quite important to understand how these two farming systems are different uh, in their management and in their outcomes. So we see it does vary a lot between different crops. Uh, and the most important one here, let's see if I can, um, winter, there we go. Um, for example, here we see that the yield gap in legumes is way smaller. Uh, yield gap with perennials, so if we look shrubs and trees, is smaller. Uh, soybean here, yeah, but it's also a legume. So we can see that um, the, the plants that are creating their own nitrogen uh, often have less trouble reaching a good yield than the plants that are not able to synthesize their own nitrogen. And that says something about why these cropping systems are, are, are different. Oop. All right. So, um, yeah, as I said, uh, we see that, uh, and it's, uh, this is from a paper, she's uh, from Seufert, uh, where she discusses why, uh, why these, uh, this yield gap appears. So we have uh, the input of nitrogen, if there's a good input of nitrogen and a, and a good nutrient cycle, we see that uh, organic performs uh, quite okay compared to conventional, which is the one. Um, so organic matter uh, gets a lot better um, when so organic matter, so organic matter, this irrigation. So uh, on the organic processes, we see an in increase of uh, so organic matter, which helps with water retention. Uh, we see that um, the importance of management, so good uh, crop management generally uh, will create good yields um, and it improves over time. So time since conversion, so uh, organic systems often make up in time uh, for this. And that's in the next slide, it's the same. This was a research over 10, 10 12 years where they were comparing these different farming systems with each other. And that over time, organic systems um, tends to uh, uh, improve and uh, by their functioning, by their internal functioning, keep up with uh, conventional systems. All right. Um, Yeah, so here we see the different management forms. So we start off on a field uh, with the same kind of background. So we have uh, natural soil there, <laughs> same soil background. There's groundwater in the same spaces. Uh, there is the same amount of solar energy. 
But then by the inputs we put in there, uh, we see that uh, systems function differently. So we can or put in synthetic or yes, or put in syn synthetic fertilizers uh, and plant protection, um, or rely more on organic fertilizers, green, uh, manure and green manure, uh, and biologically uh, organized plant protection and crop rotation. And still both systems produce a yield. Uh, but we see in organic that it also produces some side effects. <laughs> side effects. Uh, ecosystem surfaces come out of the system as well. Healthy, uh, clean groundwater, healthy soils, uh, sustaining natural resources, uh, biodiversity. So that's how these two systems function and have different outcomes. Um, it's just important to keep in mind. All right. Back to crop, crop management. <laughs> uh, so here we see there is, uh, we see the, the how, uh, how production is generally organized. We have uh, the potential production, which is organized by defining factors. So that's, um, for example, the climate, how much rain is there normally annually, what's the normal temperatures, radiation, crop characteristics that you choose to grow. And that's all these defining factors that already set the scene for what yield you expect in the end. So it's a potential yield. Then, of course, there, there um, are water constraints, maybe, or uh, too much water, too little water. Uh, the nutrients might uh, not be fully balanced or not be fully present. Uh, so those are limiting factors. So they are pressing down on the potential yield and make it attainable yield. Um, and then... Of course, there's the crop management, and that's where that gets really important because we want to control weeds, pests, and diseases because those are the reducing factors that further press down on the attainable yield to the actual yield, uh, what in the end you'll get out of it. And of course, there is yield protection measures that will try and get closer to the attainable yield, um, and the more successful you are, the, the higher that yield will get. All right. Okay. So <laughs> let's see if uh, if this will work. So here, uh, uh, normally with the students, I have a little exercise. <laughs> so <laughs> mm -hmm. let's uh, give it another try. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I talked about weeds. So other plants in the field that compete with the crop. There are pests that eat your crop, and there are diseases that um, um, Cultural management is what you do at the beginning of the season to prepare your crop. Um, and there are long-term management choices that you can make to help with these uh, this management uh, of, the, of the weeds, of the pests, and of the diseases. Um, so... I'll try again and see if you know any of those. So what would you do if you see weeds in your field? And what would be your direct approach to this? What would you go and do? So, and again, you can put it in the chat. You can tell us. OK, uh, I will explain a bit in Indonesian, yeah? Yes, sure. <laughs> Jadi, ini, uh, Silahkan dijawab kira-kira kalau ada masalah gulma misalkan ya. Apa yang akan kalian lakukan secara langsung di situ? Itu pada kolom direct ya. Terus kemudian pada kolom cultural itu budidaya ya. Nah untuk sebenarnya kesehatan untuk mencegah si gulma ini apa yang harus dilakukan? Terus kemudian long term jangka panjangnya seperti apa ya? Ini seperti integrated with management gitu ya. Uh, jadi... Uh, sebenarnya sudah diberikan mungkin ya pada mata kuliah DBT. Silakan ayo taruh di chat. Ya, yeah. so mm -hmm. ya, yeah. so let's wait a bit. Hmm? Let's wait a bit. Ya, yeah, let's wait a bit. Let's let let them think about it. <laughs> yeah. See, the direct the direct ones are the easier ones. Uh -huh. I can also try if and... Weeds, yeah, if you have yeah. weeds in your 
farm, what will you do? What will you do? You go into the field and you see, oh no, <laughs> something else growing than what I want to grow. So how would you tackle that? Yeah. What would a farmer do usually? Yeah. There are many options, so don't worry about it. Ayo. Dicat, dicat. Eh, kalau melihat gulma itu lo diapakan? Halo? <laughs> Ayo. I would say it's early, but it's early here. It's not that early there. So I think everyone should be awake. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, there's something in the chat. Ah, okay. Yeah, people waking up. Yeah, from Gladys. Mm -hmm. It said that... Uh, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> oh. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Yeah, first it's need to to do like a soil tillage and mm -hmm. then working yeah. and then using mulch. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Soil tillage. Then, yeah. Mm -hmm. Tillage. Penyiangan is weeding and then mulch, mulching. And then from Johanna, directly pull out the weeds. Mm -hmm. And then from Sonia, Sonia, uh, oh, it's a question. Okay, so to, to answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Am amazing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so directly pull out weeds. Uh, you can see my screen still? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So directly pull out weeds uh, and then cultural would be, so that's within the season. So soil tillage is very important. Uh, mulching, so you can mulch afterwards. Um, yeah, very good. Directly pull out weeds, harrowing, it's another weeding. That's weeding, any other types of- Maybe hand weeding and different- Yeah, hand weeding. Can be machine weeding if you have one. So duck that's indeed weeding. direct. Hmm? Duck, duck weeding. weeding. <laughs> duck weeding. I put that with cultural because I think that's oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If yeah. that's direct, maybe we can put it halfway. And mm. from Vivari, Vivari said that using herbicide. Yeah, using herbicides. Uh, yeah. So I'll put that one here. Herbicides, for sure. So again, very direct way. If you see the problem, and then you tackle it. You remove them. And this can be by hand weeding, machine weeding, duck weeding, uh, herbicides. Yeah, for sure. And then in cultural right here, also quite a few good ones. Soil tillage, mulching, uh, adding ducks to your fields in that season. Uh, and you want an idea about long term? What would you do in the long term to to address weeds or weed pressure? And I see a hand raised. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Cereal Surely, is hand raised. Mm -hmm. Who is it? Shirley. Uh, oh, Shirley is here. Shirley. Would you like to ask something <laughs> or say something? Oh, no, I'm gonna, uh, I'm Shirley, I'm from PSDKU, Ube Kediri, and I want to uh, answer your question about the crop protection, and maybe we can do it about the crop protection with carrier the weeding and soil tillage, maybe, and then mm -hmm. spray the pesticide. Yeah, sure. That's a great approach. So these are all direct ways of working with weeds. Very well done. There's another answer from Benny Setiawan. Mm -hmm. uh, use a cover crop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cover crops. And then mm -hmm. from Santi, uh, polyculture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's maybe long term, yeah. Yeah, almost. Yeah, so what does uh, cover crop uh, 
What's, what does it have to do with? I'm looking for something special, of course, here. <laughs> so we start to think about our crops uh, also in the future. Yeah. So we're thinking about crop rotation. So in detail, can we cover crops? So smartly alternating your crops um, helps with uh, wheat pressure. So crop rotation is a long-term thing. So you keep thinking about it in the future, over the years. How will you address that? Uh, and how to how to deal with it? There's also answer polyculture here. Yeah, polycultures, amazing. I'll put it with cultural. Polycultures can help. Uh, <laughs> polycultures. It's already being messy, but it doesn't matter. Polyculture cultures can really help. Uh, yeah, reducing uh, the competition by weeds because you're feeling issues. We'll come back to that in the, in the next presentation. All right. Do we feel courageous to pe do pests as well? Hmm? Yeah. And, and you all have good answers here, so I'm uh, I'm feeling you could tackle a pest. Yeah. What would you do if there's a pest? So we go into the field, and the farmer the goes, yeah. what about the pest? So you go into the field, and you notice, oh no, my crop is being eaten by something. <laughs> Sails, hairs. Uh, so uh, can I answer? Yeah, sure. Okay, for fast direct, uh, maybe we can use a technical and mechanical control, like take, pay, mm -hmm. take the fast directly and throw it away. Mm -hmm. And then so, for cultural, we can use a biopesticide and then sanitation and crop rotation to prevent the pests. Mm -hmm. For long term, maybe we can use an antagonist microorganism like trichoderma or metarhizium and use PGPR for a plant growth. Yeah, Thank so you. the natural enemies, right? Uh, yes, natural enemy. Okay. This is another response. Uh, mm -hmm. She said from Sarah, mm -hmm. she said, just take it directly. Yeah. Uh, so pick out or pick it, <laughs> take it out directly. Take mm. it out. And yeah. The other one from so Melina, it said, uh, oh, but still related to the wheat, yeah, here. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. It's like a systematically weeding, herbicide, legume, okay. cover crop, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. From Rifari, using uh, natural enemies and increasing biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so you can add natural enemies. So I uh, had the, the, uh, what the previous student also mentioned. So you can add those, you can uh, have bio biocontrol uh, natural enemies, but you can also uh, increase the biodiversity around the field um, or even in the field. And in that way, uh, invite natural enemies in. So then you're more dependent on the natural uh, biodiversity. But uh, yeah, it can go both ways. You can introduce them or you can invite them by, uh -huh. yeah, by increasing yeah. biodiversity. But then, of course, you need to adapt your system to that. From Rahmat Arif, uh, yeah. says using refugia and mm -hmm. uh, natural enemies. Nice. Mm. I don't know how you read that, but yeah, for example, refugia. Yellow okay. trap. Yellow traps, yes. That too. That's from Melina Azulma. <laughs> Very smart. There you go. So that's another one. Um, Uh, so the uh, the pest is in the field, and then you can uh, add yellow traps or other sticky traps or uh, think hormone traps are there too to attract the pest out of the field and onto onto those traps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. And they're awake. This uh, 
smart group you have here, Uma. <laughs> Very good. good. Yeah. And mm -hmm. we should have you offline. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you. I'll leave diseases for now. Um, but you can see, yeah, so there are, uh, for most of these things, there are direct ways of addressing. So you can see uh, the problem is here, and you address it directly. Um, but you can also adjust uh, your farming system to it. So uh, adjust the tillage, adjust mulching, adjust your choice of crops or choice of additional crops. Um, or add ducks to your system. <laughs> um, or try and invite natural enemies or uh, increase uh, increase biodiversity around the field or in the field. Um, you can use cover crops and crop rotation. You see, adding uh, diversity to the crops is incredibly important to management as well, and keeping these pests and weeds and diseases under control. So that brings me to, let me see. Uh, yeah, so that brings me to my next. PowerPoint. Um, I'll remove this one. There we go. Let me see. Yeah. So this brings me to crop diversity. So how do plants benefit from having diversity around them? How does the crop management benefit from that? And we already saw a little bit just now with this exercise that uh, wheat and pest management is benefiting from um, having diversity there. So we'll go through uh, how, how this works or how this, what this looks like. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about plant ecology to, uh, to warm you up and to let you understand how these things work. And then about crop diversity in space and time in genes and different, different cropping systems, how they use this. All right. Um, so all crops, uh, all plants, all plant species are different plant species because they have different traits. Um, and uh, if we talk about crops and uh, crop environments, we also like to talk about functional traits. So how are they uh, built up and what do they look like? Uh, because they're all a little bit different. So if you think about, uh, if you think about plants, there are uh, different architectures. Uh, root systems, so they have shallow root systems, we have deep root systems. They sometimes fixate nitrogen, and some don't. Um, they uh, flower, they might have pollen and nectar at certain moments. They have a certain growth time, might be very short, might be very long. Um, flowering time, they have nutrient requirements, as I said in a previous presentation, that are very different. Um, and because they're all different, uh, we can make use of those differences. So we are looking for uh, niche complementarity. So they have these traits and they are filling a certain niche, a certain um, niche within the ecosystem. Um, and they have a certain ecological role in there. Uh, and then if we think about cr crops, so we can see on the right top um, part, uh, we are not only having functions when growing, we also have a certain management. Um, so a salad is managed very differently than, uh, than carrots or than rice or than uh, potatoes or apple, apple orchard. Um, so we can see here that the carrots are harvested with this big machine and it's really roughing up the soil. And that's another trait basically in this management traits that you have when growing these carrots. Um, so that brings us to, yeah, looking how crops could go together um, because we're looking for the complementarity in traits and in surfaces uh, and make it a niche complementarity. Uh, and we see all here, so on the right, we see how, how two organisms can work together. Um, they're uh, there's competition, so both don't go, they'll be competing. Um, there's neutralism, so the plants don't really benefit or uh, compete, so they don't have positive or negative effects when growing next to each other. Um, and then on the left, uh, we see the facilitation. So this is when both organisms uh, profit from the presence of the other one. 
Um, and that's where we want to go with these combinations. So on the left bottom, I showed the example. Uh, what we grow here often in vegetable gardens is carrots and onions together, because both release um, release compounds into the air that repel the pests of the other. So the carrot is um, putting compounds into the air that repel uh, the onion, um, the onion stem borer, and the onion is smelling like onion and the flies that go come on the uh, carrot don't like that smell. So they're also repelled. So this is when we get facilitation. So they both benefit that they are both there. Um, and that's what those combinations are interesting <laughs> because uh, why not make use of those benefits uh, and on those surfaces that they provide each other? And the same you could think about with root systems. If you have a very shallow root system with a plant and a very deep root system, uh, the shallow one takes the nutrients from the top and the other one takes the nutrients from the bottom of the soil. So they're not really competing. They're making the most efficient use of the nutrients available in the soil surface, in the soil. There you go. So um, <laughs> getting to more complex uh, uh, frameworks, uh, we are trying to layer those surfaces because we see the mixture, so uh, mixture of crops uh, with the provision of the surfaces to each other can uh, yeah, increase uh, yields, it can increase the potential of that combination. So if we see on the left, there is, uh, going back to my pointer, there we go. So if we have one surface, so there's one crop with one surface, so that we have yield. Um, there we can combine two crops, and there is uh, the one provides yield, or that has a good production, and the other one is a biocontrol of pests. So it repels the pests of the other, uh, or pests generally out of the field. Uh, we can also have, we can layer another one in, and have yield, biocontrol, um, maintenance of soil fertility. Um, so we can start being smart about these things and add surfaces on top of each other. So we're being really efficient in a way. And that's what we see on the right. We can see how that might uh, add to yields by having all those gradients together. And uh, we do see how that uh, adds to the system. So this was a great paper of uh, Bellois. And he studied, uh, he did a great meta-analysis, how crop diversity is adding uh, the surfaces. And we see the increase of surfaces. So there is, if we start adding, so if we add complexity or uh, crop diversity and plant more crops in the same field or around each other, we see higher biodiversity emerge. So uh, more butterflies, more birds in that field. We see a higher pest control so we talked about just now how pest management is organized. Uh, there's better water quality. Um, greenhouse gas emissions seem to uh, reduce. Uh, there's a little bit better production. Uh, product quality goes all over the place. We're not really sure yet. Um, input use efficiency is increasing. Um, however, we do see a lot of variation still within those studies. So it's not... Uh, one size fits all, it's not a silver, silver bullet approach, uh, but we do see uh, improvements, let's say, slight improvements. And it's very context dependent, of course. Um, let's see. So again, what we do see, uh, yeah, instead of uh, the, the very specialized systems, we have large amount of inputs, um, and a large harvest. We see the same as happened with uh, with that organic production in the, in the previous presentation, that we reduce, we slightly induce, reduce the amount of inputs, and we give more space for ecological processes on the field. Uh, we can also add diversity, uh, we can uh, create that efficiency. Um, we do see that harvests do decline slightly, but we do have a lot of other surfaces to come out of it. So clean water, biodiversity, um, and less externalities, less pollution, for example. Uh, I would like to yeah. add something. To yes. Yeah. So uh, 
if you see specialized in the left side, it means monoculture, mm -hmm. yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, the right uh, side is agroecological approach. So it's yes. comparing between monoculture and agroecological approach. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, indeed. So uh, that's fully correct. So on the left, we see very specialized, see a lot of monocultures. On the right, we have the agroecological approach. We try to include more diversity and that reduces our amount of inputs as well um, and creates uh, less externalities and more other ecosystem services, for example. So that's indeed where we're trying to go to. Okay. Um, I don't know how we're doing in time for energy. I'm looking at Uma. Oh, <laughs> Can continue? Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> then I'll continue. All right. So uh, yeah, so crop diversity, I talk a lot about it and combining crops, but okay, what does what does that mean? What does it look like? Um, how would we do this? And there are generally three approaches to add diversity to systems. Uh, and crop diversity to system. So the one, the first one I show here is genes. I'll talk briefly about what it means, but we can combine different varieties with each other. Um, here we have tried different potato varieties with each other to help with disease uh, suppression. There is diversity in time. So one season I grow one thing, and next season I grow something else. So that's uh, the diversity in the crop rotation or in the crop sequence. So I add different crops in time. But when I'm looking at the fields, there's still one crop there at one moment. Uh, and then I can add crops in space. So I have one field and I have multiple crops that grow in there uh, in whatever uh, combination. So that adds multiple crops to one season. So I will show you a bit more detail. Uh, so we start off with diversity in genes. So that can be a mixture of cultivars. Uh, so on the left here, we see uh, this is a seed breeding company and they're really trying out all these different varieties, uh, mixing them up. We have green salads here with red salads. <laughs> there are different types of leeks here, different types of cabbages uh, and how to mix those up and what effects does it have. Um, then we can think about crop mixtures. So, uh, that's the diversity in genes uh, to all mixed farmings. So uh, what, uh, what combinations are we making? But I'll stay with the cultivar example for now. Because um, here we see this is... Uh, uh, so this was, a, a, again, a meta-analysis where they looked at uh, how many cultivars were mixed and then to the relative yield. So uh, the yield increase, so one would be a monoculture of one cultivar. And then the dot is if we add, if we start growing two cultivars together, what's the yield then? And we see about 20% higher yield if we grow two cultivars together. Uh, three, it's also rough, roughly around that. Four or more, we make another jump. And there is about 40% more yield than would be if you grow them alone. Um, and we can look, okay, what, does, what is that based on? Uh, so we have disease, disease and physical basis. So um, they both have different uh, disease repressive uh, effects. Um, or is it just disease or just physical? So uh, they have physical advantage when growing together. And we see here that especially the combination um, is... Uh, really beneficial. So physical already is quite good. So we throw, throw two cultivars that are physically uh, complementary. Um, if we would combine them just for disease reasons, again, we uh, this also has good effects. Uh, and if we do both at the same time, so for example, a grain that we combine against lodging and against disease, uh, we see great improvements if we're combining these cultivars. So again, this can be really helpful uh, in the field. Uh, All right. Marel, yeah. yes. we only have two or three minutes more. Okay. Uh, two or three minutes more. Cool. I'll 
Let me see. <laughs> Or it's it's actually also fine if you want to have all all morning. <laughs> no, let's not do that. I'm just checking what's important. <laughs> what's most important? Okay. I'll whisk a bit through it a little bit quicker, and I'll skip some of the examples. And I think 10 more minutes. Is that okay? okay. Can I bark? And, yeah. 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 <laughs> 10, 10 more minutes. Let me check if I can reach that. Okay. So as I said, we have uh, diversity in time. So that means uh, rotation-wise. So what crops are we putting uh, differently in time? That can be crop rotation. Uh, it goes to be relay cropping. So if we look at relay cropping, this means I am growing two crops, possibly within the same season, but they don't fully overlap in time. Uh, so we start growing uh, crop one, and then later on we sow and crop two into it. Uh, and that makes use of the last uh, resources at the end of the season. Uh, and again, we see good yield improvements with that, with that uh, exercise. Of course, uh, crop rotation is incredibly important with all the <laughs> all the improvements there. And we see a healthy crop rotation. So the more crops we add to that rotation uh, often means that the crop within the season also increases. So we see 15, 16% yield increases just by having a smart alternation of your crops in time. So, so weeds. I'll skip this one, it's a bit complicated right now. And then there's diversity in space. So how to use your space. Um, I already heard polycropping or polycultures, um, and monocultures, intercropping, cover cropping, uh, all the way to very complex farming systems. And they all have these, again, they have these traits and, uh, and functions. So we see here that can help with nitrogen fixation, soil quality, Yields, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, well, if I talk about a monoculture, I talk about one crop at the same time in the same space. This is uh, a field in Germany when I did my PhD. It's about 60 hectares wide. Um, that's about the same size of an average Dutch farm. <laughs> um, it's one field of 60 hectares being planted with winter wheat. And again, also this was organic. So again, in, in land, many land use systems, you see a different use of space. We can start adding two crops together. So under sowing, cover cropping, adding that uh, second layer of plants within the same field. And that's often, yeah, often and not, not always, it could be two cash crops together, but it can also be a cash crop with a supportive crop, which you don't harvest or is less important to your income. Also, again, we see increases in yield here. So 20% increase to uh, 30 or even 50% increase while when compared to monoculture. So they seem to benefit from each other. Um, we see uh, this is strip cropping. <laughs> That's where we combine technology uh, with diversity. Um, so the strips uh, are big enough for our tractors and our machines to go through. Um, that makes it accessible for Dutch farmers. So again, we have to place it into a context. And for us, this, this is a diversity measure that works really well. Uh, we can make it even smaller. <laughs> so this is spatially very complex. Uh, we see very tiny little fields with Uh, one crop or one set of crops for a little square. Uh, we're just, again, this is an experiment. We're pushing the boundaries of diversity. Um, all right, but we can also think about perennials to the system. So tree we have here a traditional system on the left, a Dutch traditional system. So having animals graze under your fruit trees. So combining trees uh, with animals or trees with uh, other plants. So on the right, we see um, coffee in the, on the bottom combined with a nitrogen fixing tree. All right. And then all the way, we can go all the way up to increase, uh, yeah, 
a huge amount of complexity. So here we see annuals, we see perennials. There are animals in the system, so livestock, different types of livestock. Um, and uh, we can really start to think these create really complex systems. Um, well, we can study, okay, how, what is production doing here? How are those functions distributed? Uh, and how is everything making use of everything? Um, so this is where I wanna wanna leave it. Um, yeah, because I think afterwards. Yeah, there are many. Hello. Saya terdengar ya, Meryl ya yang freeze. Iya, yeah, terdengar ibu, ibu Meryl yang freeze. Oh, Oke. Okay. Lihatnya. <laughs> Question. Is there any question? Yeah, you can be there. <laughs> uh, okay. Hello. From Sebuway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you finished with the presentation? Is it? Okay. Thank you. It's really nice. Yeah. It's a holistic approach on how to uh, manage a uh, crop. It's cover a lot of things from. Uh, Physio, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, physiology, photosynthesis, <laughs> uh, crop oh, diversity, mm -hmm. and many other things. And we saw here some question. For example, uh, let's see, let's see the old one. Oh, from Sonia. Mm -hmm. Chris Nasari, uh, I want to ask question, are there any obstacle in implementing organic farming in countries with different climatic conditions and what are the differences in obstacle between countries? Uh, you can read it. Yeah, I'm reading it. Uh, that's, a very, that's a very good question for one. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there are many obstacles. Well, at least not depending on the climatic conditions. Um, it will need a different approach based on the context. Um, like to understand the climatic conditions and how those are affecting the farming system and what then is important to uh, include in management. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the most important, mm -hmm. but it can yeah. also be more important like how the socioeconomic context yep, is. Correct. Because yeah. that will, I think, have a greater effect mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. on how mm -hmm. what the obstacles mm -hmm. might be. Mm -hmm. So we talk about markets mm -hmm. or uh, mm -hmm. facilities, yeah. etc. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I also agree that actually the climate condition is not an obstacle mm -hmm. uh, because uh, we are as farmer, for example, they can always adapt. Yeah, although different side, they have different ways of uh, managing this uh, organic yeah uh, so it's more on the management uh, so yeah see another question uh, ah, this is in Indonesian yeah. so I have to yeah. translate it for you uh, uh, it's about inten uh, ecological intensification mm -hmm. uh, 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 what is the best strategy the effective strategy uh, to manage uh, pests and disease in the long term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's related to uh, ecological intensification. Okay. Um, it's most well if in ecological intensification we yeah we aim to uh, produce amount of inputs so we cannot rely on direct uh direct uh solutions the whole time so you have to have a quite a sound and um stable approach to your farming where you start adding these diversities and start supporting the ecological functioning of such a farm and that it can uh, buffer its own pest outbreak and it can buffer um um 
uh, disease spreads or uh, has enough uh, natural enemies within the system to eat or predate on pests. Um, so that's how uh, it's it's a balance to have had. <laughs> it's a, uh, but I see good management practices mm -hmm. uh, that can really support that function. Mm -hmm. And then these farms function relatively well. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to move away from the... Uh, you cannot be as uh, dependent on direct approaches as you are uh, with uh, other types of farming systems. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. That's you agree? The, 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 the challenge actually in uh, agriculture, uh, ecological intensification, that we really need to put those uh, species that are, how do you call it? Uh, help each other, for example, not compete each other. That's the challenge. That's also make organic farmers are smarter than other uh, farmers. Yeah, because they keep thinking how to uh, how to manage this complexity in their, exactly. uh, in their uh, farming system. I don't know if they're system. smarter, but they do work with... At least they think yeah, more yeah. than a conventional. For conventional, they just buy... Herbicide, the pesticide, that's all. They do not think how to yeah. uh, manage them uh, sure. in a holistic way. Very different mindset. Yep, yep, yep. You have to have a yeah. lot of knowledge about the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another question I would like to ask about mixing farming and integrated agriculture. Is there any similarities between them, between mixed farming and integrated farming? Mm -hmm. Or they are actually the same? And is there any specific interval time between the efforts to empower biodiversity by enjoying maximum ecological services? Hmm. Yeah. So do you think mixed farming and integrated farming the same? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> yes or no? Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> oh, dear. It's... Mixed farming specifically uh, uh, refers to the mixing of crops and animals, crops and livestock. Mm -hmm. um, however, integrated agriculture, I think, overlaps with that. Mm -hmm. uh, has more to do with integrating ecological co-functioning into the mm -hmm. farm. And it can be done by adding livestock, mm -hmm. but not necessarily. So it's... Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I, I agree that currently we have a lot of concepts that all swim into each other a little yes. bit. Um yeah. But that's my, at least my understanding of these two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're similar, but not mm -hmm. exactly the same. Yeah, I will uh, answer from Indonesian point mm -hmm. of view, because uh, if we said integrated, it must be between plant and animal. Okay. There okay. in Indonesian. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but it's not only like, uh, it's not completely integrating, mm -hmm. uh, meaning yeah, they put plant and animal, but they, it's not necessarily that the animal must be on the plant field, so they can be separated. But uh, yeah, something like that. But that's what we have in Indonesia. If it's integrated farm, normally we always think about uh, mixing plant and animal. Yeah, but but uh, generally not always. Yeah, integrated, yes. for example, integrated with management. It's it's uh, yeah. yeah. Again, it's also check context. Yeah, yeah. And and we're all use these mm -hmm. terms. Yeah. And of course, a different culture, they have different uh, concept. And then uh, I might ask, what is the difference uh, in yield between planting a single cultivar component to mixture of several? So, so it really depends if you have successful combination um, but yeah, as I showed you, the, the meta-analysis found that there was about, um, in, in good combinations, you find 20 to 30 to 40% uh, percent yield increase uh, by planting these together. Um, I think there are great studies done in rice, actually. Um, and here we do this a lot with potato. The only downside is that you go through your resistance cultivars pretty quickly. If you grow them a lot, <laughs> yep. then the risk is to yeah lose that benefit. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what we're currently struggling with. Mm -hmm. It works really well. <laughs> we mm -hmm. see a great yield increase, mm -hmm. um, but uh, we also run the risk of uh, burning through our resistant genes. 
Oh yeah. yeah. Another one from Sarah. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your best way to increase the biodiversity in field but keep the balancing ecosystem between crop, that plant, and the other organism? Yeah. Wait, there's, there are multiple different approaches that all seem to work uh, to increase biodiversity. Um, so using less synthetic <laughs> pesticides and herbicides uh, will increase the amount of the organisms being able to live around in, in this field. Um, and or, and again, there are multiple different approaches, uh, making use of your landscape elements. So uh, if there are trees around your field or hedgerows or any other plants that can harbor biodiversity, so they have a, they need a refuge, we talked about that before, uh, then they have a place to go. So uh, they are not necessarily within the field, but they can stay somewhere close to the field and provide their functions. Um, and then we see that if you add a complexity within the field, so the crop diversity or adding ducks or fish, we also see that this biodiversity increases. Uh, and then within the field, so you harbor them there. Um, so these are all different ways of going about it. Uh, so there are many different ways of approaching. Mm -hmm. And the next question actually almost the same okay. uh, from the previous one, but it suggests if there any mod modification can be done. Yeah, just the same. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I How does top management respond? Top management respond to changes in the external environment. Ah, it's from this policy. Is, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, uh, is top management, you mean crop management or top-down uh, management? Uh, that's good. Um, in in my mind, it said about the leadership, like okay, the how can like government? I mean, yeah, it has a huge effect. Um, it, policies or local policies or uh, international policies. Uh, these all have effects on choices farmers make, on what's possible, what's what's um, achievable, what is what facilities are available, and what is supported. Um, and this all has effects on and how to deal with with the farming system. Um, so for sure, whatever top down or a bottom up approach uh, is is needed, it will always be in this context of what uh, the local uh, government is uh, is is organizing what education is like, what uh, facilities are are available. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and the next is about the the diversification. Yeah. yeah? Is it like uh, although like one type of species but different varieties. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So we see. Is, is it still? Like, uh, we see with any generally uh, adding complexity to your field helps with a lot of things. Um, so even if you already do two and two different cultures first, uh, it helps with uh, yield and um, maybe even biodiversity. Uh, but yeah, we, we also have then again we have a few downsides with that. So. Um, the the resistance breakthrough uh, and sometimes harvest. So, <laughs> how are you going to uh, peel apart these varieties after harvest? Or um, uh, here we 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 had those potato yields and they all had different colors, and then mm -hmm. we just market them as such and we mm -hmm. put them all in the same bag and like oh we now have disco uh, mm -hmm. disco potatoes. <laughs> they all have different colors. Ah, yeah, just so, the same. Like in China, they have this. Uh, tall rice and then yeah. low rice, they exactly. are uh, grown together, yeah. something like that. At least there are some uh, diver uh, city yeah. results with that in harvest mm -hmm. in, uh, in yields. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but then it's yeah. like, okay, how to harvest that? Harvest yeah, that's, that's uh, yeah. The, the challenge. Please. Yeah, next question about agroforestry. How uh, this agroforestry can increase Food security, mm -hmm. uh, but also improve uh, the environmental uh, qualities. Yeah. Of the, yeah, quality of environment. So on the one side, if you start adding perennials to your system, um, we like in our forestry ideas, we like to 
add perennials that are helpful to us. So not any any tree or any bush, but fruit bearing, nut bearing, um, medicinal trees. So you add a tree that's helpful to your system or is producing something. So it can be a product on its own. So it can be timber, uh, fibers, whatever you have in your local <laughs> your local uh, uh, system. And then we see because a tree or a bush is relatively permanent, we see a lot of biodiversity automatically making use of that. So um, birds like to be there, uh, insects like to, to, to nest or live there. Um, it's an automatic uh, thing we see happening. Um, but then, yeah, choosing for something you can use or sell or um, uh, instead of just any any tree, <laughs> uh, that's this principle of mm -hmm. agroforestry, making use of perennial uh, crop. Yeah, crop trees. Uh, still, there are four more questions. Oh. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, the next is about the agrobiodiversity. If they already are uh, diverse, mm -hmm. then uh, do we still need uh, other control? For pests and wheat, for example. Uh, how do you mean? So, if you're ready, so, diverse. Okay, yeah, because uh, the purpose for this biodiversity is to uh, manage pests and wheat, uh, yeah. something like that. Is there any other? Uh, do they still need, like, maybe using herbicides or pesticides? It it, uh, it depends on your system and your approach. Uh, there, so if you. I showed you because I work with organic systems. There, to have organic certification, not even allowed to use any synthetic mm -hmm. inputs anymore. Um, and we see that these systems still produce something, right? So uh, they're still productive. They still mm -hmm. uh, create a harvest. Mm -hmm. um, however, there's also something halfway, which is uh, we call it integrated pest management, where um, you leave space for these eco ecosystem services to take place. And sometimes when you want to address, um, I don't want to say emergencies, <laughs> then you can still apply a little bit of pesticide and herbicide to spot treat, uh, whatever problem you're having. So again, this is a whole, it's a whole gradient of approaches where there is the, yeah, the, the, the very controlled approach, <laughs> a very intense controlled approach until an organic approach without um, without any inputs, and all are um, yeah, all are productive. They just all function a little bit different. Yeah, actually, there are still <laughs> a lot of questions. Well, I don't want to say we're not. We're all guys. Should we continue, or I can just copy it and then uh, uh, it's not. I need to it's check if I have on. a meeting at one point. Yeah, <laughs> the same. I also have another. Uh, yeah, we'll see. I, I will try to uh, take all yeah. of this question and then uh, maybe we can email you uh, the response mm -hmm. and then, uh, yeah, give it to the students later. And I think, uh, do we still have the vice director there? Prof. Ani? Yeah. Prof. Ani, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Prof. Ani, apa kabar? Baik, baik, baik. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, uh, I'm sorry that I I just knew that you okay you okay. <laughs> it's actually should be opened by the vice uh, okay. director, but she can close this uh, sure. course. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, one more, uh, Prof. Ani. I heard from Bu Ois that uh, PSDKO want to have this uh, uniqueness on uh, smart farming. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, and then I had a discussion with people uh, from IPB that the approach actually can be done uh, from two sides. The technological uh, farming system, uh, smart farming, and or ecological smart farming. Mm -hmm. So what we have here is uh, ecological smart farming where the technology comes from nature, something like that. Yeah. So, we can discuss further later if some of our Wageningen people visit PSD town. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, of course. We <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Meril. Uh, the, the topic is very interesting here. I, I followed for the uh, for the first 
you uh, deliver the uh, material and uh, I think this this one is uh, can enhance the knowledge of the student and also for the uh, the young lecturer here I I, I know if Johanna also uh, yes I'm here Prof. yeah follow the, the the class here and I, I have one question. <laughs> yeah, uh, and 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 your topic is organic crop, isn't it? Mostly, mm -hmm. yes. I, I think the same. I I'm from aquaculture, mm -hmm. uh, but the agriculture is leading first, then then aquaculture for the organic. But and she also graduated from aquaculture in Wageningen, right? Yeah. Your Thirty years ago, but for a long, 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 long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I have a question. What what the benefit of the organic uh, crop if compared with the conventional, even in cost production? Because because if if I know the price is uh, not not very high different, but the the cost production is I think. Uh, little bit different with the conventional because we use the artificial for the fertilizer. Is it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it how, how the the delta? Uh, I mean the uh, profit of the conventional and uh, organic agriculture. Oh. Do you have any idea here? Oh, <laughs> It really depends uh, where you are and what the context is, because here we see indeed we have less costs with um, uh, with inputs, um, so less uh, fertilizer, less uh, synthetic pesticides. However, mm. we do that they're using more uh, fossil fuels because a lot of the direct treatments is with tractors and going to the field to have mechanization. Um, so that sort of yeah, when I say balances it out. Um, and then, yeah, the yield is a bit lower. Uh, and then, but they do get a higher price for it. Mm -hmm. So I think here farmers generally, um, so in the end, under the, uh, under the end, yeah, in the end, it's relatively the same, I feel, but that's mm -hmm. for this context. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Yes, if I look at the graph for the, your uh, slide, the production, the end production of the conventional and organic crop is very high, the, the delta. <laughs> yeah, the different, it's quite high, but again, How many percent? How many percent if, if uh, you use the conventional and organic? So the yield gap is about 20% on average, but it really depends on the crop and the context. Um, so yeah, yeah. So, yeah. but that's currently our or the average. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, but if if we talk about the organic organic crop, we we talk about the area, not on the spot. Only only one spot. Not only one spot. This is uh, area. How how many how many area? If we use the organic. Um. We, we, in Europe, we have, uh, I think on average now to 10 to 12% organic farms area. Mm -hmm. uh, balance is 4%. We're lacking, oh, really? yeah, we're lacking behind on Europe. Oh. Yeah, it's really, the European <laughs> Union wants to go to 25% area. So some countries are already there. We're for sure not there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we need a bit more land to produce the same yield. However, we do see uh, by crop diversification, we can get yield increases mm -hmm. and we can achieve the same yields as in conventional. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So where mm -hmm. our, uh, and then even technological mm -hmm. solutions mm -hmm. can be of benefit in that mm -hmm. system. Yeah. yeah. If you see from economic side, yeah. Uh, if we have this uh, uh, crop divers, uh, diversification, then one crop may be the price higher than the other, then we can get benefit from this diversification. Okay. Okay. Also, we we can talk about the integrated, isn't it? Yeah. 
<laughs> integrated <Okay>. agriculture. Yeah. <laughs> not only one, only one commodity. <laughs> okay, thank you yeah. very much. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you, Bu Ani. We will see you soon. Oke. Okay. Ya, uh, terima kasih adik-adik. Uh, uh, kita nanti nyambung pada hari Senin ya. Uh, ada tentang Lighthouse Farm uh, lebih lebih general. Nanti baru secara fisik saya akan membawa beberapa uh, dosen yang dari sini untuk ke SDKU secara fisik memberi kuliahan di sana. Terima kasih Prof. Ani dan Oke, okay, selamat untuk semua. Selamat sore. Terima kasih Prof. Ani. Ya, saya izin live ya. Gitu kok gitu. Oke, bye. Baik, demikian untuk kuliah 